Apple leaping to 3 nanometer for 2022 iPhones and Macs. iCaveDave.com forward slash merch. I'm Mike Dave and I simplify Apple so that everything just works for you. And if you want the latest Apple news, leaks and rumours every weekday at 12 UTC, like this video, subscribe to the channel and ring my bell and we'll give you a really good reason to do that later in the show. Now, I was convinced that we'd be getting 4 nanometer chips for 2022 and I'm pretty sure that there were rumours around this time last year about Apple buying out all of TSMC's 4 nanometer process production for the first 6 months or so. And yet, as Intel fixes their process by simply renaming things so that it looks like their 14 and 10 nanometer chips are somehow different, Apple and TSMC seem to be ready to leapfrog the 4 nanometer process with 3 nanometer being the target for the A16 and M3 generation chips. This shift without Apple doing anything else to optimize their chips would offer a 10 to 15% performance gain and a 20 to 25% efficiency jump over their current 5 nanometer chips. So just making an M1 on this process would give around an 8800 multi-core geek bench score and a MacBook Pro that can run for 22 and a half hours on a battery charge. However, there are some outlets, including Nikkei Asia, that have suggested that Apple's 3 nanometer process could debut on a 2022 iPad Pro, which would suggest M2, I guess, but that would push that into the second half of 2022, which doesn't make much sense to me. They also suggest that that year's A16 could also be built on 4 nanometers, which seems unlikely as the core design will be shared, but it's not impossible. On the plus side, in about a month's time, Apple will be on stage telling us themselves about the A15, presumably on the 5 nanometer plus process. So while TSMC presses on with the cutting edge of chip production, Apple continues to book out huge chunks of that production in order to keep their products on the best possible performance. I, for one, am happy to be on Team Apple Silicon, as it doesn't look like anyone is going to be catching up anytime soon. Now, I'm pretty sure that Apple will be deciding if they should go ahead with these better chips or not, based on the number of likes and new subscribers I get on this video. So, it's best to do that right now. It might not be true, but is it worth taking the risk? Is it? Exactly. Next up, a bill is being introduced into the US Senate that, if successful, would force Apple and Google to open up their platforms to other app stores. Now, this comes via Apple Insider. Senators Richard Blumenthal, Amy Klobuchar and Marsha Blackburn are sponsoring the bill, which is dubbed the Open App Markets Act. It would place restrictions on massive app marketplaces, which the senators believe would wield too much market control. The, the bill would prohibit app stores from requiring developers to use their own payment systems, for example. It would also bar app stores from punishing apps that offer different pricing structures through another online payment system or platform. Additionally, it bans app stores from using non-public information to compete with third parties. Now, as I've said in the past, I'd prefer to keep Apple's App Store as the way to get apps safely onto an iPhone or an iPad because allowing others simply compromises security on the platforms. Now, I understand why people want choices and choices are good but here's what happens once other app stores can be used there will be an epidemic of app stores impersonating the official apple app store with compromised clones of existing apps linked to from the web because of these cloned apps the app developers will be likely to lose revenue as i would guess their apps will get pirated and distributed in other areas as well as those compromised ones putting your phone and your data at risk now, I do admire the principle of having more outlets for apps, and I do believe that competition is a really good thing. I just don't think this is going to end well, but let me know your thoughts down in the comments. Am I wrong? And before we get into your questions in iCave Answers, a quick update on the iCaveversary on Sunday. I've been booking in time slots for our guests, and some of the biggest names are already in their slots. Constant Geekery is there pretty early on in the show, so don't miss the beginning. Brian Tong, Luke Miani, and John Prosser are all booked in. Now, I know that confirmed is a dirty word in the Apple news sphere, but this is as close as I can get when we consider that these are human beings that sometimes things might happen in their lives, but they've said they're coming. So if you don't want to miss it on Sunday, make sure your notifications are turned on with ringing that little bell just, just down there. Uh, because I don't want to be sat here on my own for six hours just, just talking to myself. <laughs> right, let's get into your questions. First up, Lit8, IK Vances, can I get a shout out? Yes, you can. Here is a shout out. And Lite has got a YouTube channel. Um, not got a lot of videos up there yet. Uh, you were asking me how you can get more subs on your channel. Make more videos. There's not a lot there. So people are more likely to subscribe once they've got more stuff to watch from you. That's that's kind of the secret. I make a lot of videos. 
Master Kvalchek asks, IK answers, what are your thoughts on the Apple Newton? Have you ever owned or used one for a long time? Is it indeed the complete failure as people make it out to be? Now, Marcin Kvalchek is one of the guys that is really into the vintage stuff. He is the reason we will be looking at and probably doing some some playing with my iMac G4 during the live stream. And uh, have I ever used an Apple Newton? Yep. So that's the EMA 300. It was one of uh, Apple's kind of Newton products that was, I think, designed for schools. It was designed for education. But it does include a pen, and it does include um, writing recognition, handwriting recognition. This thing, this basically does what Apple Scribble does on the iPad. Like, it recognises your handwriting and turns it into text. It's crazy. So if you want to see a bit of Emate 300 action on the stream, make sure that you let me know down in the comments, and maybe we'll play with some old Apple stuff as a part of that event. Blair McConaughey asks, IK Answers, assuming that Apple did intend to release M1X Max at WWDC, and it was a supply chain mini LED issues that caused the delay, do you think they will try to get back on track with the M2X for June, July 2022 release? Or will a September delayed release this year make Apple wary of releasing the product, superseding the previous gen by only nine months and the backlash that might cause? I don't understand why people think that uh, we should delay stuff in future because they've only had the new thing for nine months. That doesn't make any sense to me. And if that was the case, then Apple should be doing exactly the same with iPhones this year and not releasing them in September because the pandemic slowed them down last year. So it looks like we're going back to our September release for the iPhones. What I don't know is because this is the first generation, they might just go, well, actually this works as a release schedule. So we go um, A15, this September, then we go M2 in the spring next year, and then we go M2X back into September along with the A16 chips. That kind of makes sense to me. Um, I would love it if they were going to do it with the A15 and the M2 coming together, but it doesn't look like that's the case, but we will see, I guess. I don't, I don't think it's a particularly good idea for people to think that their product gets worse because something newer comes out. That doesn't make any sense to me. However, I would say if you know that something's coming out in the next month or so, don't buy the old one. Um, but at the same time, if you've had nine months of M1 that has been awesome, then I don't think you need to worry that the M1X or the M2 is coming less than a year later. I don't think you get a right to a year of exclusively being the fastest thing that there is. That just doesn't make any sense. Cleveland Iron Man asks, IK Vances, isn't MagSafe charging considerably slower than charging with USB-C to Lightning with a USB-C wall charger? Um, not considerably uh, slower. Um, it looks like they might go up to a 25 watt fast charging standard this year with the iPhone 13 slash 12S. We still don't know exactly what it's going to be called. There are conflicting rumours out there. But the MagSafe charger does charge at 15 watts. And to be honest, I think this trend for people wanting the fastest, fastest, fastest charging is uh, probably a bad thing. Because, let's be honest, because people also then complain that their batteries don't last as long because they've ruined them with trying to shove too much charge in at once. I would personally think that 15 watts is absolutely adequate, but in all honesty, I don't think my iPhone uh, 12 Pro Max has actually got to less than about 40% since I've owned it. And that's because I use it on a charging mount in the car, so that tops it up during the daytime. Um, and I use uh, the wireless charger here at the desk, which is only a 7.5 watt charger, which is absolutely adequate for what I need. It's only ever charging at 7.5 watts um, at the maximum. So, honestly, the speed of charging is not as important as people seem to make it out to be, especially when they then complain that their battery health is less than 100%. The Duke of Kidderminster asks, IK answers, how much sleep do you get? Uh, answer, not quite enough. Although I would say I did get an early night last night, and this morning I'm actually shooting this on the day rather than shooting it the night before. Um... So that's kind of been a nice little luxury for me. Greg West, I have answers. I'm curious about the rocket behind you. It looks like an Apollo service command module, but the booster is not a Saturn V or Saturn 1B. Tell us about it. Does that model fly? So that one behind me is actually a Soyuz. That's what they're currently using um, other than SpaceX to fly astronauts up to the ISS. Uh, the design has changed very little since the 1950s, well, since the 1960s when Yuri Gagarin uh, flew to space for the first time. Um, but... If you want to know how big the Saturn V was compared to that, because I think that's a 1 to 144th scale model. 
I have a Saturn V that's the same scale. That's Saturn compared to the uh, Soyuz. Saturn was a lot bigger. And Starship is even bigger than this. So we've had a fun bit of space talk at the end of our um, show. Don't forget, Sunday, make sure you're subscribed. Make sure that you're here because you do not want to miss this. It's going to be epic. Uh, and there might be pizza. Pizza.